Kilbrony Park, this beautiful open parkland that runs between the Ferry Glen and the mountains proper, is now in public ownership and is one of the really treasured amenities of the local population. The jewel in the crown, some would describe it. But the formal layout of the place and the occasional exotic jewel will tell you that this was once the domain of a big house. The big house in question was known as the Lodge and was the original residence of the Ross family, later to become the Ross of Bladensburg dynasty. But the Ross connection came to an end in the mid-1850s, and thereafter the estate had a number of different owners, some of whom had quite illustrious careers in their own right. One such was the Honourable Albert Stratford George Canning, a brilliant scholar and a prolific writer, who was in more than nodding terms with the likes of Charles Dickens, Lord Macaulay and William Gladstone. Now, one of his hobbies was the collection of rare plants and birds and animals, which led to some strange and unexpected encounters in the Fairy Glen. Imagine walking alone one night and encountering, besides the red squirrel, the pine marten and the otter, a herd of Siberian yaks. I didn't myself encounter any yaks, Siberian or otherwise, when I spent a fascinating few hours with Mark Parker of the Forest Service, as we walked up through Rus Trevor Forest, following the path most probably taken by C.S. Lewis as he climbed up to the Clockmore Stone. Like me, Mark is very fond of trees. In fact, he's quite passionate about them. But you won't be too long in his company before you realise that there are some trees he likes better than others. And if I had to hazard a guess, I'd say his personal favourites are the ancient oaks of Ross Trevor Forest, even ones that should have gone to tree heaven by now. If I just pry this back here, right. just inside you'll find there's all sorts there's of a couple of wee grubs in there. Yeah. And in other ones, if I pulled them right back, you would actually find wood lice, etc. Right, right inside. So that's a and habitat there. No exactly. Right. A big habitat. Correct. Right. And even the ivy, although there's not much in this here, but yeah. ivy itself, I mean, there's another stump there beside. Right. The yeah. ivy itself too, there's there's insect life that be associated with that. Right, right. And at least then, these stumps, right. they're not going to present a hazard to the public walking by. So you leave them upright as opposed to letting them lie across Correct. the path and all yes. words, because there are hazards across the path. They can be, they can yes. be. Right. Or understand. indeed, if the tree was bigger, right. the danger of branches dropping down on folks. I understand. And Whilst we could have cut that down and left it lying on the ground, fallen deadwood has also a, a very valuable um, yes. biodiversity benefits, yeah. but standing deadwood too, mm. and it's nice that it gradually breaks up, yeah. and it'll yeah. eventually rot away. What you have here is the remnants of what would have been typically found in these lower slopes of, of, the, uh, of the countryside. Right. The oaks are very poorly formed, they're very stunted. Is so that because the ground itself is a the bit ground is poor. not that great? It's poor, yeah. and also you have exposure from the sea. Of course. And right. they're a very poor form, so for timber purposes they're not good. Which That's is probably why the left. reason why they survive. <laughs> right because on, yeah. by approximately 1400, yeah. Ireland had lost most of its natural woodlands. So we can picture somebody coming along in the end of the 1300s saying, ah, leave those ones yeah, that are a bit exactly stunted and not That's much it. use right? So it's actually sort of it's regenerating itself, is that fair to say as well? Basically, yes. What we do here, we ensure that um, invasive species will not be allowed to take over. You have to understand that by invasive species, Mark isn't just talking about things like Japanese knotweed or Himalayan balsam. He means really anything outside our native trees like oak, ash, hazel or holly. Trees that support the greatest biodiversity. Trees that produce food for the red squirrels, the pine marten and other native animals. When we reach the famous Fiddler's Green, where annual festivities are still held, Mark outlines the Forest Service strategy for Russ Trevor in brilliantly simple terms. So this is the limit of the oak wood here, is that the case? Of the oak wood, right. which is a, a statutory designated site. It's a special area of conservation, I the see. oak wood. Right, right. But what we're actually on he here now as well is the edge of the ancient woodland site. Right. So whilst the, today's oak wood is confined within that lower slope, we have the ancient woodland site which goes beyond. Now, obviously, we have conifers planted in that now, but it's still. Would it be have gone behind us even, or yes. further on up? Oh, very much further over, yes, right. much right. further over. Uh. And we can still find the remnants here, and particularly under the larch trees, which are one of the lighter conifers, you actually have some very good ground vegetation, which is the remnant of the ancient woodland. I see. You'll find stumps there as well, but more importantly, you'll find the ground species that go with it. Many, many years ago, mm. those trees disappeared, long before Forest Service came on the scene. You're not but taking the blame for them? We're not taking the blame right, for that. Right, okay. But we certainly did plant these conifers, there's no question of that. Yeah. And this is one of the areas where we're looking to restore the ancient woodland. Mark makes no apology for the planting and the eventual harvesting of the coniferous plantation. 
This is the economic imperative of the Forest Service. Timber is a valuable resource and it's what brings in the much needed revenue. But he also admits that they're learning all the time about the best conifers to grow. Large trees admit a lot of light which promotes the growth of ground cover. Just compare this to what grows under the dense foliage of western hemlock, for instance. Absolutely nothing. The worst thing could be that we would actually take these conifers out in one go. That was a thought that people had come up with originally and said, oh, we'll just take the conifers out and let it come up again. But right. that's not what would happen. Probably what you would actually have happen would be invasive species would move in, things like sycamore, and they'd probably take over the area. In a wee while I can show you a very big old sycamore tree which is beautiful in its own right, mm. but it only holds maybe 15 species of insect, as opposed to, say, 200 species for an oak tree of the same size. I see. True to his word, Mark took me to a shady dale created by a spreading sycamore tree. A splendid specimen in its own right, but, like the Clockmore stone, not native to the area. Unlike the Clockmore stone, it's cloning itself all around the forest floor. And if they get a hold in place, they will they will regenerate themselves Absolutely. over and over again. Absolutely. And, and much, much, much faster than oak trees? Very much faster, mm. yes. You'll find them in a couple of years, you'll find them taking over the area. But still, you know, if you were to get oh. rid of that, you wouldn't be very popular with a lot of the local people here. I don't think it would be. No, because this but is... I think if we can find some way to ensure that this doesn't spread, keep spreading its seed around and about, mm. so it'll be the, the younger ones removed from around it. Aye. But I was certainly, I wouldn't like to be the person to take the decision no, to have that removed. No, no, I mean, it, it is a beautiful thing. It is. The beautiful and, thing and where it is here creates just a, a little yes. dingly dale on its own. Very much it? so. All, it's those, all those ferries that you have down in the Glen would, oh, be, yes. would be very at home here. I oh, I would say they'd be definitely around here. The dilemma posed by this sycamore tree, much loved and visited by Ross Trevor ramblers, illustrates the kind of conflict that often arises between the need to cater for the public and the need to promote the greatest biodiversity. I'm just glad there are people like Mark around to resolve such conflicts with understanding and patience. The ancient oaks of Ross Trevor have witnessed many a coming and going over the centuries, but I doubt if they've ever witnessed anything quite like the vision you're about to behold. Before you do, here's some music to soothe the nerves, provided for us by the extraordinarily creative Siobhan O'Dwine. Musician, composer, conductor, teacher, author of historical romances under the pen name Kathleen O'Farrell, and leading light of the Tom Dunn Summer School, founded to commemorate the heroic and self-sacrificing life and ideals of this Ross Trevor-born member of the United Irishmen. An 18th century hedge schoolmaster who suffered a savage fate flogged to death rather than betray his neighbours, and in whose name the great and the good from all corners of the arts, academia and politics gather once a year in Ross Trevor to debate the burning issues of the day. Siobhan, being Siobhan, also makes it a fun occasion, hence the fetching costume I'm partly wearing. When it comes to gathering the great and the good, Siobhan, as you'll hear, is pretty well connected. My eldest daughter was actually born into this house. Right. Right. And uh, after my mother died, then we sold it and moved back into the old house. And um, so eventually it came into the possession. Two years later, it was bought by Martin and Mary McAleese. You've heard of them. Of course, yes, <laughs> yes. She she did rather well for herself she did, down yeah, in the south then, didn't yeah, she? She did yeah. rather well. Uh, so this, this was, she actually lived here for quite some she time. Did, yeah, it? bulletproof and windows, right. tankproof gate. We've got you know? yeah, right. So you're quite friendly with her. You, you would have known her in a previous existence. Okay, yes, yes. Well. So we were students together at Queen's. Yes, right. That goes back a long way, yeah. But well, the house itself is in a beautiful location. We're looking straight across the Cully Mountains over there, across Carlingford Lock. Beautiful view if it wasn't for all these lovely fruit trees and so on that you have down down in the garden here below yeah, you. They're a liability. Oh, do you think so? Yeah, no. look, at the, look at the number of plums I have to cook. Oh, you, you have to. You feel <laughs> as if now you have to go and do something with them. I do, yeah, yeah. I should say before I go much further, right? Because <laughs> I do feel I actually got quite used to this now. Yeah. You know, I feel quite comfortable. Well, you look very well, Joe. You know. Well, it was made for a slimmer man. <laughs> 
And you tell me the slimmer man was in fact John Malkovich. Yes, well, I believe it was it was used in the film Dangerous Liaisons with Glenn Close. Right. So this this yeah. was literally the costume that he wore in Dangerous Liaisons. Yeah, one uh, of them, one of them. So he was a bit slimy and seductive, wasn't he? In that, <laughs> he in that was, film, as far as I remember, he was horrible. He was horrible, right? But apart from that, it fits me <laughs> not too well. But the whole yeah. point of these costumes, Siobhan, is that you use them to recreate a period. Is not the case? That's right. Every year we have a, a special dinner to commemorate a dinner which was first held in 1792. And at that dinner, Wolf Tone was the guest of honour. Right. Here in Ross Trevor? Yes, yes, right. in Arnesville. And we we have the same toast, the same food, and uh, people make an effort to try and dress. I, I don't think there would have been too many were. There wouldn't have been too many wearing this, this <laughs> yeah. sort of you know, lounge lizard costume, no. as it were. You know? But it is it is from the period, isn't it? Yes, Rough, it roughly yes, speaking, it the is, late, yeah. late 1700s is, yeah. or something yeah. like that. Yeah. OK, so this is really part of the Tom Dunn Society that you run here. That's right. Tom Dunn was the local head school master who became a, a United Irishman after the visit of Wolf Tone and during the disarmament of 79, but it was a very strong area for the United yeah. Irishmen, but because we weren't actually involved in the rebellion, yes. it's maybe overlooked. Yes. So we like to draw this by, by having the summer school every year, where drawing people's attention to the story of Tom Dunn, mm. which in a way is a universal story, because every, every village, every community has their heroes, and who did a lot for their own people, yes. but they don't make it to the history books. Yeah. And there, after an all too brief visit, we leave the village of Ross Trevor, whose people ensure, whether they make it to the history books or not, that their local heroes are remembered and celebrated in grand style. <laughs> <laughs>